we happen to live in the most abundant society ever in human history. I'm not saying that stuff happening in the news isn't real. I'm not saying that. But I am saying we do live in the most abundant time ever in human <laughs> civilization. We live like kings lived 100 years ago, but we don't feel that way. And this practice that you have with your six-year-long daily email, and I had for the four years I did the blog, is a vital practice to cultivating a positive mindset. And if you could cultivate the positive mindset, man, everything else opens up. You've become one of the thought leaders in, in positive thinking practices. And I'm, I'm curious at what point, and I, I kind of think I know the answer, but I want to hear you. I want to hear your, your version of this, but at what point did you transition from a leadership development coach who had this little part-time blog thing on the side to yeah. an an awesome blogger who was moonlighting as a leadership development coach in your yeah. mind. Well, okay. So let's just, so I worked at Walmart from 2006 to 2016. I started mm -hmm. writing a thousand awesome things .com in 2008, the book of awesome, which is the book based on my blog, not to be confused with our book of awesome, which is the 10 year later sequel that I just written, but the book of awesome came out in 2010, like for eight overlapping years, eight overlapping years, I wrote five books. I gave 200 speeches all on the side of working my full-time job at Walmart. And the reason I did that was a couple fold. One, uh, I just got divorced. I had no I had three contacts in my phone. I was living, now I'm living in a shoebox apartment and down, I got nothing else to do. There's 168 hours in a week. You divide it by three, you get three buckets of 56, right? You sleep eight hours a night. That's eight times seven. That's 56 hours a week. You work a job like I had a very busy, demanding job at Walmart. I went from manager of leadership development to my last job at the company was director of leadership development. In the middle, I had a four-year development assignment working for our CEO as his project manager. So now like writing speeches, traveling, you know, doing work for our CEO. And this is a big, these are, these are big jobs. But I will say, even though they were big, they weren't more than 56 hours a week. They weren't more than 56 hours a week. That's still eight hours a day plus 16 hours on evenings and weekends, right? Well, that still afforded me the time and the ability to spend 56 hours doing something else. And what I did when the blog started to take off and I'm starting to get invited to like give, you know, TED Talks or whatever, is I went to the Walmart ethics department, which they had because they're the world's largest company. They got departments about anything. And I talked to the guy and I said, I, I'm getting invited to like, you know, do speeches and stuff that I'm getting paid for. What's the conflict of interest here? And he said, let me get this straight. You're writing a blog on the side about how to be happy, little positive things. I was like, yeah. I said, uh -huh. he's like, and you are uh, trying to teach other people, you know, through motivational speeches. I said, yeah. And he said, are you mentioning in your speech anything confidential about Walmart? I said, no, I don't. Uh, my speech is not about Walmart. It's the three A's of awesome. That's the name of my TED talk, you know? He's like, okay. And at Walmart, are you, you know, and he just double checked. I was like, no, I mean, he's like, basically you're great. In fact, he's like, there's people at Walmart all over the place. They're like, I'm a DJ on the weekend. I'm a wedding photographer. I'm a real stage. agent. you know, these days, you know, we have words for it now, the side hustle. At the time I thought I was breaking some law. So I double checked with ethics and they're like, no, what you're doing is good. In fact, do you mind giving a motivational speech to, to you know, the auditorium here? We aren't going to pay you. You work here, but could you give the talk? So I would do stuff like that for Walmart. And I happen to have, a wonderfully progressive, you know, culture and company that just support, they just supported me. They were, they were kind and supportive and they loved, they loved the fact that I was doing this stuff on the side. And so I got lucky that way. I'm thinking some organizations, you know, they have a pretty clear policy that you can't do two jobs at once. But in this case, what I would do is I would look at the amount of vacation time I would get from Walmart per year. And it was like three weeks of vacation. And then I would calculate um, how many, you know, for example, speeches I wanted to do. And I told the speaking bureau I wanted to do 20, right? And this is a little bit inside baseball, but I know you're interested and maybe some of your listeners are. And then I would say to the speaking bureau, how many of those 20 can you move to evenings and weekends? And they'd say, about half maybe. I'd say, okay, well, the evenings and weekends, I'm good. What about the other half? They're like, well, that's 10 more speeches you got to travel for. So then I'd go back to the Walmart HR department and I'd fill out a little piece of paper that said, 
I work a- annually, I would do this. And everybody can do this in every company. People don't realize this. All you do is fill out a piece of paper with your HR department. You say, I request 10 days of unpaid leave per year. Okay. Almost every company has this. People don't use it. So I would turn my three weeks of vacation into five and it would supplement the time I needed to do the extra, extra speeches and so on. So I did both for as long as possible. And now you're probably wondering, well, then why'd you, you know, how'd you decide what to do? By the way, the, the motivational speaking and uh, writing all these books job uh, sounds cool and sexy, but don't forget, man, it's got no, it's got no pension. It's got no benefits. It's got no, uh, you could fall off the face of the earth in 10 minutes. If you aren't showing up on light Watkins podcast, you know what I'm saying? So there's a lot more grind in that job. And so I called up Dave cheese, right? Who was the CEO that I worked for at Walmart. And I called him up and I said, Dave, I'm trying to decide what to do. And he said, Neil, you only got to perform two tests, my friend. Number one, the deathbed test. When you were deciding between two jobs or a current job and a future job, which would you regret not doing more on your deathbed? That is the deathbed test. And I said, okay, well, you know, Dave was, had moved on to a kind of a mentorship role to me. So I was like, well, I'm, I think I'd probably regret the writing thing more if I didn't do it. You know, I'd written a few books at the time, like, but I, I never leaned in all the way or I was spending my time writing. And you mentioned my pockets. Well, I could not even imagine doing stuff like that because I was, you know, working a full-time job. I said, like, I think I'd regret that more. He said, okay, the second test is the plan B test, which is you got to conceptualize and visualize and get comfortable with what you would do if you failed. Okay. So he said, okay, so, so tell me, Neil, if you go be a writer full time and it flops, because the odds are it will, <laughs> you know, just the odds, general odds in life about trying to make it as an artist of any kind is pretty low. So what are you going to do? And I say, well, I guess I'm going to be dusting off that LinkedIn profile, <laughs> you know, and I'll be knocking on the door of Walmart and any other company. And he said, OK, could you get your mind around being comfortable with that? I said, yeah, I, I think so. I've got, you know, now I've got 10 years of work experience here. I've got, I've got the background here. He's like, okay, I think you already know what you want to do then. You, you did the two tests. And I will, I say that because those two tests are valuable tools for anybody who are considering between a current option or a future option or two different options, the deathbed test and the plan B test. And if you can answer those two questions in your mind, it'll help you make the decision. So at that point, so 200 speeches, five books. In 2016, I then went to become what I do now. And I say, what I say that I do is I say, I think, write, and speak about intentional living, right? I've subsequently written books about happiness called The Happiness Equation, a book about resilience called You Are Awesome. This new book, which I feel is centered around community, which is called Our Book of Awesome. Yeah, it's a litany of awesome things, but You read the book, you know, it's like there's voices that appear, there's comments that fly in. There's I'm trying to do some some creative stuff in the book. And to be honest with you, now that I look back, man, I think I was too risk averse. I think I was too risk averse. I had the cultural heritage of being a doctor and if not, definitely be a lawyer or an engineer. And if not, definitely have a job, (laughs) you know, like have a place you go with the salary you get, you know, have, have, have a benefits plan man. So I, I look back and I think, well, you know, if I, if it, if I had left a couple years earlier, you know, maybe then I could have, you know, started that podcast or done that training course. Who knows? But I did it the way that was meant to happen for me. And that's the thought process and the process that I went through to do it. So, Look, I've written books before, published books with publishers. You're one of those rare authors that has a runaway bestseller, like a legitimate New York. Everyone says I'm a bestseller. I say that about all my books, bestselling books. I'm not a New York Times bestseller. You became a New York Times bestseller. And I know that when you're going through the publishing process, half of the half of your proposal is your marketing plan. <laughs> Did you have some yeah. special marketing plan to become a New York Times bestseller? Like what was what were the mechanics yeah. of that? Um, yeah, sure. I'm happy to go into this in detail. It's interesting though, because I will say it's a really, really, really big percentage being luck. Okay. So let me tell you about luck. Um, 
I won an award from the International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences for best blog in 2010. And when I came home, there was 10 literary agents in my inbox eager to sign a book deal. Well, I said to a blogger friend of mine named Christian Lander, who ran a blog called Stuff Why People Like, hey, I just got this email from this guy uh, named Bird. You know, what should I do? And he's like, you did? Hold on a second. And then like 10 minutes later, I get an email from his agent at WME. Well, Right away, that's a lucky break because what now you have happening is a bunch of agents trying to go for you. Okay, mm -hmm. that's that's that that already is a rare situation. I had this lucky thing where it's fortuitous on award, and then agents hear that other agents are going; they're all interested in, in it now because the other agents interested in it, right? Well, then when you got multiple agents interested in it, the agent gets very excited. Could you do a book proposal? Well, my book proposal was two seconds, man. File print. You know, I already had the blog. I just had to pick the 10 best ones. There you go. That was the that was the book proposal. Well, she sent it around to five publishers or maybe more, but five publishers bid on it. And so right away, you have a, another lucky thing where if you have more than one publisher interested in it, they all try to outbid each other. This is not a healthy practice. I don't think it's a smart practice. I don't think it's a logical practice. But publishers want to win books that are hard to win. You heard about Obama getting $43 million for his memoir. Does that make any sense? See, you know how much a book gets paid? It makes no sense, man. There's no way they're going to get that much back in royalties ever. Right. Not that many people read like it's just not going to add up. Right. But when you get into a bidding war, then what you enter into is a lot of publishers competing for each other. Here's the bidding war. And I'll, do you want me to go into like numbers and stuff? No, you'd have to go into that much detail. OK, well, well I'll, I'll, here's what I'll say. There was a there was this publisher at this bid at this price, then another one at this price, then another one at this price and then another one at this price. And then Penguin had a house bid for uh, a, a number that was substantially higher than all the other numbers, okay? Like mm -hmm. more than double kind of thing. And so I said, well, what do you what do you suggest? And she's like, well, I suggest the, the biggest number. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean a house bed? She said, that means there's two imprints within the house that both want the book. So I talked to both of them. The first one was uh, a publisher. I just won't say the names, but the first one was an imprint that was famous for doing blogs to books. They had done the, the Law Cats book. They had done the Chuck Norris book. They... I got I got on the phone. They were on time. They were very polite. They were very friendly. They said, just give us your best blog post. The book will be out in a trade paperback and kind of a newsprint. It'll be out in three months. Well, as a blogger who has a full-time job, like that was music to my ears. I don't got to do any work. The second imprint was a woman who had had her own imprint within Penguin. She had published zero books. She had just signed one and I would be the second one. She was late to the call. She had a very specific vision to the book. She's like, I can't be putting in these things that you got written, like blowing your nose in the shower, farting after the guests leave. She's like, I'm not writing that stuff. <laughs> She's like, you got to write like half of the stuff's got to be new. The uh, the market is like women who are like looking for a gift. You know, it's a hard cover. It's not a paperback. It's going to take you a year to do what I want. And I was like, whoa. That's a really captivating vision for someone who is a brand new kind of publisher. What's your first book called? She's like, I just signed a, a book with another first time author, warning sign, named Catherine Stockett. It's a book called The Help. You'd be my second. Her name was Amy Einhorn and her vision captivated me so much that I called my agent. I said, I want to go with her. And she said, you want to go with her? But the other guys, they know what they're, they've already done all the, I said, but the vision was so on hardcover the she had this vision for it it was not going to be all the juvenile stuff i was writing so i went with her well you know what she made the book because she got so excited about it she had such a clear vision for it that she got the salespeople excited for it so they get you know walmart excited for it and target excited for it and costco excited for it and those people then buy more copies of it and suddenly you got the book everywhere when you got the book everywhere with a high advance guess what they do like they push you on the Today Show because they can't have a failure now, right? And so what I'm saying is I had the benefit of all these tailwinds coming after me. I'll tell you, mm. 10 years later, it's the opposite. <laughs> you know, it's not, <laughs> it ain't like that anymore, right? But what I'm saying, what I'm saying back in the day, it was like being on the Today Show alone makes your book a New York Times bestseller. When Meredith Vieira flashes the image of the book on screen to 40 million Americans in the morning, you're a, you're a New York Times. It wasn't because of me, man. I was just someone going through the riptide. Now, 
thing about books in general, and you know this, is they got legs. If people like the book, it's word of mouth and nothing replaces word of mouth. A few key influencers like the book. In Canada, there's a woman named Heather Reisman. She picked the book for a Heather's Pick. That means all the Canadian bookstore chains. I see you taking notes. I love it. Say all the Canadian book, say it's bookstore chains started carrying the book. So and then it took off. And then the word of mouth got bigger. They printed 6,000 copies of the Book of Awesome in Canada. And it sold out in one day. And so you started getting stories like, I drove to 12 bookstores and finally got a copy. Well, you know, the lineup outside the nightclub is what sells the nightclub, right? So it was suddenly became this hard to get book. And it was like, so I was the beneficiary. I, I was going through this thing because of all that. And because I had written the blog, and this is another good takeaway for people listening is the community create was created first right? I had written a blog every single day for two, two years straight. So when the day I announced I got a book, that's two years worth of readers who had to click a button to buy it. So the book debuted at number two on the bestseller list. The number one book was called Oprah by Kitty Kelly. And then it was number one the next week. And it stayed there for like a hundred weeks, like a hundred weeks in a row. It was, un it was unbelievable. To the point where then I, they asked me, rush, rush for a second book, the book of even more awesome. That came out a year later. And that was, then they were number one and two together. For like so you didn't have a big problem getting a date when your book was number one on the New York Times bestseller list for a hundred weeks in a row, did you? Oh, uh, well, it's funny because my confidence is still pretty weird. Like I, I was like, I was dating and dating and dating. I started going on online dating sites. Okay, that took me a while to get comfortable with that idea. This was pre Tinder and stuff, so I was like, right. you know, I was on, I was on like OK Cupid, right? And um, and then I went on a lot of first dates, and uh, I'm in my mid forties now, and you can feel my energy in this conversation. Well, imagine just wheel this back fifteen years, man. My energy was like sharp and flying all over the place. I don't think I was a pleasant person to have a first date with, right? Like, I just, I just, I just, well, at least no one called me back. Let me put it to you that way, okay? So I had, like, a year of dating and just, like, constantly ghosted. Like, I was, like, I was not sending out the right <laughs> messages to the world, okay? Like, I was, it was not working out. No one was interested in date number two with this guy. So, I mean two years of that after my divorce. Then I finally met someone who I liked, who had liked me. Her name was Leslie. She's a teacher at a Toronto Public School Board. We go on another day and another day and another day. And I had created two rules for myself after first marriage imploded. Number one, you must date for one full year before you live together. And number two, you must live together for one full year before you consider marriage. Those might seem like short time frames for most people, but you got to remember, I proposed to my first wife after a few months, okay? So mm -hmm. these rules were like, I'll wait to stop this giddy little guy from going, getting too excited too quickly. And so after a year of dating, we moved in together. And important note, we found a place together. It's not I moved into her place or she moved into mm -hmm. my place. You got to find the place together. You got to go through the looking process, the decorating process. The, that is vital. That is vital, right? Then after you're living together, I asked her to marry me. And I don't want to flash forward too much in the story, but Leslie and I have now been happily married for uh, eight years and we have a bunch of little kids and it's been a wonderful and joyous and lucky and fortuitous series of events since. And talk about Thank your... Thank God uh, my first wife left me. <laughs> <laughs> talk about how you got the inspiration for the happiness equation, speaking mm -hmm. of your marriage. Good catch. Okay, so I, so Leslie and I, when we got married, she had a vision I'm a big fan, as you can tell, of like following If other people have a very clear vision with Amy Einhorn, my editor, I was like, she's got a vision for the Book of Awesome. Like, let's go with her vision. But Leslie had a vision for our wedding. She knew where she wanted to get married since she was 16 years old. There's a place in Toronto, east of Toronto, called the Scarborough Bluffs. It's just the part of Lake Ontario, which kind of just feels like you're on the edge of the ocean. She always knew where she wanted to get married. And she had this vision for it. So I was like, okay, you take it away, you know? And she really planned the heck out of that wedding. And I said, 
hold on. The exchange is, I'm going to plan the honeymoon. And you're not going to know where we're going until we get on the plane. It's going to be a total surprise. And for Leslie, who has, uh, you know, organization and scheduling type tendencies like you and I both do, you know, she was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to release the honeymoon to you. Like it was kind of a fun thing in our relationship. So, I mean, we had fun with it. You know, the three weeks leading up to our wedding, I left like a different photo on our bed every night of like things that we might see or do. And we ended up going to Southeast Asia. I'd never been before. She'd never been before. We haven't been since. It was like, you know, a total bucket list honeymoon. You got to go somewhere you've never been. That's, that, was, that was my philosophy. Well, um, everything was great on the honeymoon until the flight home when she was sick, really sick. And it's pretty far from <laughs> Southeast Asia to Canada. So we had a layover in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. And it was a six hour layover. And she's like, I need to find a pharmacy. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, I need to find a pharmacy in the layover in Malaysia. I was like, in the airport? She's like, in the airport, or we got to go into the city, whatever. I need to find a pharmacy. So we found a pharmacy in the airport. And I then she asked me to find her a place to lie down. So I found a place to lie down, to like, you know, buy one of these passes to get into like, you know, some room and she could lie down for a bit. And we get on the plane. I was like, first of all, are you sure you're up for going? Because you seem really, really sick. She's like, I'm up for going. I'm up for going. We go on the plane. We take off. She goes to the tiny airplane bathroom at the front of the airplane. And she, so we're, you know, we're above the clouds here. She comes back <laughs> to our seats and she says, I'm, preg I'm pregnant. Like, a, like she bought the pregnancy test at the Kuala Lumpur airport pharmacy. She did the pregnancy test in the tiny airplane bathroom at the front of the airplane. She, we found out she's having a baby on her honeymoon. Well, hmm. not to ruin this surprise here, but, and maybe this is TMI, but we got married July 12th. The baby was born April 12th. I'm talking nine months to the day from our wedding. Okay. So basically conception was our wedding night. Basically, if you do the math, essentially. And, um, I used that wild event as fuel to try to take the past few years of my life after the Book of Awesome and its sequels had come out and I had started to become this speaker going around the world and talking to people about happiness and starting, of course, to research and read my own stuff about happiness. I was like, this is, this is the thing I need. I wrote, like, for the next nine months, a 300-page letter to my unborn son on how to live a happy life. You've probably heard the writing advice to pretend that you're writing to somebody, you know, write in an email because it somehow clarifies your writing for yourself. Well, that was a wonderful North Star for me because I was thinking, I had many thoughts, one of which was, I don't know what this says about my brain, but I was like, what if I die? Like, what if I die before the child's like 12? Anytime in the next 12 years, I could die. And if I die before I'm 12, there'll be no chance for me to share anything of what I've learned or what I know or what I think I know. And so that was the fuel I used inside of me. I wrote that 300 page letter and that became the happiness equation. And, um, you know, it's funny because when that book came out, you know, um, I, I said to the publisher, you know, should we say that this is, uh, you know, kind of a, a letter to my kid? And they're like, no, no, you know, we shouldn't say that. But I, I hid. <laughs> I hid on page, you know, the copyright page that no one ever reads. Like, here it is. I hid this little thing to my baby. And I didn't know if it was, you know, a boy or girl or whatever. To my baby. I wanted mm. you to have this in case I didn't get a chance to tell you. Love, Dad. Mm. So it was just a way for me to put in a little, you know, little note to myself. Now, um, yeah, that that was also a pretty crazy thing to do. It's interesting to talk about because... I was known at that time as the quote unquote awesome guy. I had mm -hmm. written three books in this world of awesome book of awesome book of even more awesome book of holiday. Awesome. I had a journal of awesome. I had a page a day, you know, those page a day calendars. I had written five of them. So like another thousand awesome things, right? Like <laughs> thousands more. The rip off one a day. I had written those for five straight years I had done all this stuff. And now here I am talking about happiness. Who's this guy? 
and 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 it's kind of like stay in your lane man right like it was it was a different idea to get into the world of positive psychology which has kingpins in it who are typically you know professor daniel gilbert right from harvard uh writing about stumbling on happiness professor sonia lovomirsky but you know people that have, i'm just some dude i'm just some guy <laughs> i'm just someone right but the thing that i guess i had which i think is partly why the book has done pretty well is that i had that very casual and colloquial and comedy background so it was and it was written for a child right and so it was not i didn't have two by two matrices i had scribbles that i actually personally scribbled i actually drew so throughout the whole book there's all these like little back of the napkin little drawings and, and stuff like that so there's there's a vibe in that book that almost feels like it's a book about happiness for a child you know so a uh, different target market <laughs> Well, that it also became a bestseller. So, was that just off of the heels of your awesome work, or do you do you attribute that to something else? Well, um, two things happened when the Happiness Equation came out, which was in 2016. Number one is the uh, let me give you an anecdote to describe this. When I interviewed David Sedaris for my podcast, so David mm -hmm. Sedaris. Uh, for those that don't know, maybe the world's most preeminent comedy writer he writes autobiographical comedy essays all the time. Uh, Naked, Me Talk Pretty One Day, uh, et cetera. He's et cetera. got a great master class on that platform as well. The master class. Oh, class. right. Right. Mm -hmm. And he lectures, you know, every single year around the whole world. I mean, this is maybe the biggest person I've ever interviewed on my podcast. Well, when I got into the back of his limo to interview him, he left a little Tiffany's box um on the front thing and his publicist was sitting there and he said oh that that's for you i just wanted to say thank you so much for the last couple of days in toronto and she's like oh my gosh thank you so much at the end of my interview with him in the back of his limo <laughs> for my podcast he's like neil thank, what was your what's your address and he wrote he wrote down my address and like i'm not kidding man a week later i got a handwritten letter from him in the mail hmm. why do i tell you that story it's because he makes a point wherever he goes through the media he does the interviews he's doing to recognize that it's a gift to him and his work he's mm -hmm. very conscious of that just like you having me in your pocket is a gift to me and my work right well i take that very seriously and you remember that after you're on my podcast, I ask you for your address and you live out of a backpack. So I didn't get one, but I usually try to send people a first edition or a signed copy of one of the three formative books. Right. Mm -hmm. And I try my best through the whole book of awesome journey to just be kind and thankful and grateful to all those media people who are just normal human beings like you and me. And when the happiness equation came out, yeah, sure. They'll have Neil back. Cause it's like, we kind of, We'd had enough time interacting with the Book of Awesome. So I think I got lucky that way. And with the happiness equation, it's just like I got a lot of press coverage because I'd done a lot of press and, you know, had known people. So I was able to um, reach out and say, hey, do you want to have me back on the breakfast TV show or whatever it was? And they'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. And then I'd get there and they're like, what are you, you going to talk about? And I was like, oh, the happiness equation. They're like, well, you're not just going to give us like 10 awesome things again like well, before we go to commercial? I was like, I'm trying something new, you know? And so uh, the book kind of, it that way but look I, I i'd be lying if i said i really knew all the reasons it's certainly it's certainly um it certainly is probably beyond me and now i will say today as like as it as the book industry continues to change and fragment look here i am on podcasts right and doing like instagram lives with influencers like i don't know what i'm doing like the world's changed again 70% of the books bought in the United States are bought through one company. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's not like what it was where you go around, I'll tell you with my first few books, I went on book tours. I got on planes and, <laughs> and I, I stood up in bookstores with 40 or 50 people around me. And those were the people in that community who were the nodes. They were the book clubbers. They were the ones that told other people about the books. And if you, if you, gave them your book and you signed your book with them and they liked it. They, they pass around. 
Well, now I feel totally out of my element in this digital world. I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. I feel like you got to be on book talk. <laughs> you know, I don't even have a TikTok account. So I'm, I'm like, I'm A, not sure about how it go, it's going to work for this book. With our book and Awesome, I don't really know. And B, I don't feel confident that I know what I'm doing anymore. And certainly going back on TV shows and stuff, I, I hopefully will do that. But less, less, people, less people watch TV now. Less people watch breakfast shows. Less people listen to the radio. Less people listen. So our channels are massively fragmenting. And if you can talk to, you know, lots of people in lots of places and you let your book sail, you hope for the best and it's never as good as you hope and it's never as bad as you fear. Mm. You have some pretty um, interesting habits, put it like that, <laughs> between you and your wife and in your household. You have, uh, you're, you're in a house of seven now and you, you actually have described yourself as being lazy, but you get a lot done because of the systems and structures you have in place. Can you just talk a little bit about what those, what that looks like? Sure, absolutely. Well, and the seven, by the way, includes like the fact that we, with little kids running around, are, are kind of always in a babysitter. Although I will say the seventh person does not live with us. It's just like, we're mm -hmm. always having a babysitter here. Um, we've, I've got four little boys under eight years old. Um, and we're done before you ask, we're, we're, we're finished. We're, we're, that's it. Um, <laughs> but we're very, very grateful and very, very grateful for our wonderful, wonderful kids. Yeah. I think of myself as lazy, i.e., you know, it's that old adage, which is a 2000 year old phrase that has become repopularized now, which is you do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. And so I'll tell you, it's a lot easier not to have a TV and to put a bookshelf at your front door once than it is to every single day walk by the TV and tell yourself to read a book, you know? And so when you are in your strong, that's why they say, you know, don't go grocery shopping when you're hungry, right? Because <laughs> you're going to buy all the junk food. Like go grocery shopping when you're in your best self. When, when you're in your best self, that's when you can carve out very intentional processes and practices in your life. And if you were to ask me, okay, Neil, what are some of the practices you have? I'm very happy to go through some of them. Number one, this is a new one for me. I keep 10 rocks on my dresser at all times. I think of each rock representing one decade of my life. I believe, I hope I will live to the age of 106. I have my wife's 100 year old birthday party planned for a specific date when I will be 106 years old. So I think of myself as living uh, 10 decades. Of course, I could be hit by a bus tomorrow, but I'm going to think I'm going to hold on to that vision to hope that it happens. Why do I keep those rocks in my dresser? Because I move four rocks forward. That's the number of rocks I've lived and six rocks back. That's the number of rocks I have left to live. Each one represents a decade. No matter what problems ail me at, during the day, when I glance at that little rock clock at night, it calms me down. Nothing's that stressful in the face of a longer time horizon. You've heard about larger timescale projects that people like Jeff Bezos are doing. They're slamming 10,000 clock, year, year clocks in sides of mountains. Well, this is a simple way to just sort of relieve stress before bed. I also have another rule. There are no cell phone chargers anywhere upstairs in my house. They're only in the basement, in the furnace room. I'm telling you, my cell phone lives in my basement, in the furnace room, the dark, dank room that has no, you know, it's like pink, you know, uh, stuff coming out of the walls. Why? Because I will not expose my brain to bright screens before I go to bed or when I wake up in the morning. There's research around both of those things. I can cut, start to quote the research. If you look at a bright screen within an hour of bedtime, you don't produce as much melatonin overnight. You don't get as deep a restful sleep. It's huge. So just leaving your chargers in a specific location helps because the charger has to live where you don't want to be. So then you have the extra 20 steps and you don't send the email you're going to regret at night. So then what do I do in the morning when most people are checking their phones? A, I have an alarm clock. I highly recommend people buy an alarm clock. It sounds like dumb advice now, but that prevents you from needing your phone beside you, okay? And I also recommend a landline. People laugh when I say that, but every month I pay the $20 to the telecommunications company. I'm paying for the permission not to have the cell phone in my bedroom. And I only give that landline number to like my mom, my sister, the one person that helped just any emergency contact. So I know I can rest easily knowing that I'll be reached in case of emergency. 
when I wake up in the morning, what's beside my bed? It's that it's the yellow journal I have right here beside me called Two Minute Mornings. All I do every single morning is I write down, I will let go of, I am grateful for, and I will focus on, right? I will let go of, and I can go into the science in each of these three statements, but for now, you can kind of believe me, you get rid of an anxiety that you wake up with. I will let go of comparing myself to Tim Ferriss, right? Whatever it is on a given day, <laughs> I am grateful for the fact that I get to connect with a friend in Mexico City today. Mm. I am grateful for, you know, I, I you just... I, I'm grateful for the hot sauce I got last night, whatever it is. You write down a couple of gratitudes. We talked about this already. We know we know the research, Emmons and McCullough. If you write down 10 gratitudes a week, you're not just happier over a 10-week period, but you're also physically healthier, okay? you The cheapest workout you can do is writing down gratitudes. And then lastly, I will focus on, we live in an era of decision fatigue. If you do not write one thing you will do each morning, you won't get it done. <laughs> And it'll sit subconsciously in your brain. So that two-minute morning practice is a vital system for me, Light, because it it basically primes my brain for positivity all day. We know the research. That means I'm 31% more productive, got 37% higher sales, 300% more creativity. We can go on and on and on. And I'm only taking two minutes to do it. The average person's awake for 1,000 minutes a day. So I'm taking a 0.01% time investment to make that whole other 998 minutes better okay you, you, so you also things. you also have your wife confiscate your phone for 48 hours over the weekend yeah, which, I, Friday. which some people may look at that's very extreme how long well, has that been happening well it, it it honestly i need to do it a bit more but what i what i what i do do is on a friday when i'm usually you know friday night you know five six i say i give i give my phone to my wife and i say hide this from me and don't give it back to me till sunday so even if I ask, even if I beg, even if I plead, well, listen, like we all got laptops, right? So if I really want to do something, I can open up the thing and fire up the, the laptop, but it just prevents me from having a compulsively checking thing. And I will also add on my phone, I have no social media apps. I have no news media apps. I have no email apps. Mm. I don't even have email app on my phone because guess what? You can go open Safari. You can type in gmail.com into the browser. Gmail will send you 10 alerts telling you, telling you you're doing it wrong. Download the app. Download this. Download that. You have to say no. You have to enter your password. Super annoying. You have to read it on a browser. Super annoying. But if you need it, you got it. But you make it frictionful to get to it. And again, mm -hmm. systems beat goals. So rather than saying, oh, I'm not going to compulsively check social media and email, well, I just don't have the apps. So I, you know, I'd, I'd have to, I'd have to download the app, get my two-factor authentication password emailed to me, check my email in my browser, then memorize it and enter. It's too annoying. So I don't do it unless I really, really, really have to want to or need to, right? So it just creating those extra steps prevents me from doing behaviors that I don't really want to do. People say, oh, Neil, how do you do this three books podcast? You must be reading so many books, right? I had you on. Well, of course, I'm reading How to Win Friends and Influence People before we chat, right? I'm, I'm reading the books in advance. I end up reading 100 books a year these days. Why? It's because of I'm deleting all this other stuff from my brain. If you don't consume news media and social media and you have a bookshelf at your front door and you don't have a TV, well, what else are you going to do? <laughs> like, it's like... <laughs> That you, now you don't have that much other things to choose from, you know? So I'm just really careful about what I ingest, not just through my mouth, but through my brain. And what is a failure budget? Ah, <laughs> yeah. It's funny when I, when I first started moving down, when I first moved downtown after my divorce, um, I started getting invited to lots of stuff that I had, no experience in like um a theater club or a concert to some salsa uh, thing i just and instinctively my answer to all of that was always no i don't i don't know how to do that i've never been part of that i feel uncomfortable in that situation i want but when you're lonely and living in a tiny bachelor apartment for a long period of time with just your job and your blog to occupy yourself man 
it really makes a difference starting to say yes to some of that stuff. And I noticed like that whatever I would say yes to, regardless of what happened, it was a net positive experience for me because the amount of learning from a social perspective, from a, even a knowledge perspective, was huge. It was st- Your learning curve is the steepest when you know the least, right? Your first three swings of the tennis ball, one's going in the net, one's going over the fence, the third one's going in the box. You'll never have a steeper learning curve than those first three hits. Same when you're learning guitar, same when you're learning anything. So I made a rule for myself, which is that I want to create a failure budget in my life. And the way I think about it is, if you make five-figure salary, make a rule like anything that you spend two figures on, you don't think about. It's a failure budget number. If you make a six-figure salary, make it three figures. Make it some, you know, thousand point place over on the decimal side. So if you're making a six-figure salary and you're listening to this, I'm arguing that you should therefore think that almost any three-figure opportunity that comes your way, you consider in your mental failure budget. A uh, cooking class on Spanish food, uh, 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 a jazz concert on the other side of town with someone you don't know very well, a camping trip on a bus to some uh, you know, campsite that costs $150 or whatever, you just automatically do it. And you don't think about it because it passes your digit test. Okay. You make four figures, make it one figure. You make, you make, uh, you're a tech billionaire. Well, anything 10 grand or less you do, okay, whatever, right? You just come up with a system that you don't got to think about it, but it's a, what you call, what I call a failure budget to just constantly get you trying new things. So you grew up in Toronto, parents are immigrants, dad is a physics teacher. What was the vibe like in, in your house growing up, you and your sister, in, in terms of like, what were some of the, the ideologies and the philosophies that your parents used to say to you all when you were growing yeah. up? Yeah, absolutely. Well, my mom was born in Nairobi, Kenya, and my dad mm-hmm. was born in Amritsar, India, and they had an arranged marriage in England. And the story is that my dad went on a date with my mom and performed the hamburger test. And uh, <laughs> the test was simply to see if she ate the hamburger. And if she ate the hamburger, he, you know, confirmed that she wasn't a vegetarian and he married her. I'm telling you, like, their second date was the wedding. Their, their second date was the wedding two weeks, two weeks later. And, you know, my mom's, my mom's family was actually fleeing East Africa at the time because with Idi Amin and, uh, you know, um, what was happening in other parts of East Africa, you know, a lot of the Indian people were sort of trying to get out of Dodge. And after the India-Pakistan partition, my mom's family, who originally hailed from Lahore, Pakistan, actually lost all their wealth, which was in the form of like jewelry and real estate. So my mom went from a very wealthy family to like a pretty poor family suddenly. My dad was always from a poor family. Um, his mom died at a very young age. He grew up in a you know a one bedroom home with sleeping in the same room with four brothers and sisters. And so suddenly, w- with the caste system, they were equivalent. You know, they they never would have met. Thankfully for me and my existence, they did. The hamburger test was performed. The marriage happened, and they emigrated. You said Toronto, and yeah, it's Toronto, but more specifically, it was. Oshawa, Ontario. And I make that distinction because it's very clearly the suburbs, a blue collar suburb that's a GM town, was entirely white, was entirely like, you know, yeah, there was diversity, but it was, you know, 12 kinds of white people, right? Like it was like Italian and <laughs> Polish and Ukrainian and, you know, German. And the, it was that was the diversity. So we grew up very clearly the only brown people around certainly the only brown kids at my elementary school and the vibe from my parents which you asked about honestly there's many things I could I could take you down a path right now but one of the biggest ones I loved was my mom had a philosophy through a lot of trauma with the philosophy of adding the word yet y-e-t just the word dot 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 yet anything that was happening in her life. I don't know this man yet. I've never lived in Canada yet. I would see her my whole life, like like growing up. I was like, what are you doing? You're going to the ballroom dancing classes at the German club? She's like, I don't ballroom dance yet. Even, even, even the hamburger test, they will go back to that. She didn't eat meat for the first 22 years of her life. So it was like, she was in her mid twenties when she you know, was having this burger with this guy. 
so that she was new to meat even, but it's just I didn't eat meat yet. I'm not advocating that people who grew up with a vegetarian uh, background suddenly started eating meat, but the concept served her well because in addition to you know, fleeing a country, being the youngest of eight kids, having her dad die at a very young age and having sudden onset mental illness at a, at a, as she grew older, the philosophy retained a sense of agency and allowed her to navigate a wholly new cultural landscape. And for me, growing up, it has, I think, served me well because I look at life now through the lens of I can choose what I want to do. And if I'm doing something uncomfortable or if I'm doing something, I don't know what I'm doing, as I often am, add a dot, dot, dot yet to the philosophy. And it keeps the idea that I can't, I won't, or I haven't open just a crack and gives me permission to be able to do it. Did your dad have that job lined up when you guys moved to Oshawa or was he just kind of taking a leap of faith and we'll see what happens when we get to Canada? Actually, the, the cool, he got very lucky. He, he got his, um, undergrad in science and his master's in you, you mentioned physics he's got a master's in nuclear physics from university of new delhi in 1966 he mm -hmm. jokes like that that's kind of what you learn you know in 12th grade today right but at the time it was pretty advanced and the reason it was interesting was because canada wanted to start splitting up high school science class which they had in the 60s into chemistry biology and physics and in order to do that, they needed physics teachers, but they didn't have any because they never taught physics to anyone before. <laughs> so they immigrated, they, they, they brought all the physics teachers in. So my dad had applied for immigration to uh, five countries. He looked at some list that existed in the 60s of like the best places to live. And it was like, not that different than the list you see get printed today, but it was like, you know, three Scandinavian countries plus Canada and the United States. And his acceptance to Canada just arrived first. I mean, literally, the, he ended up going to the first letter he got back to let him in. They wanted high school physics teachers. They made him then do an education degree here for a year. So he worked as a ticket ripper at a lo local public pool for a year while doing his education degree at the University of Toronto to then get a job that he knew he was going to get, which was the high school physics job. He was the first ever high school physics teacher in the, you could call it the county or the region that we were in. He was also probably the first nuclear physicist to rip tickets at a, at a local swimming pool. Yeah, well. I mean, sure. I mean, exactly. I mean, it's funny, though, because <laughs> he does joke that the stuff he learned then just happened to have been, you know, luck, time, place, a little bit further along you know, than, right. than where things were in North America at the time. But he certainly is. A fit. My dad looks like an Indian Einstein all the way to like the, the big frizzy hair, thick glasses mm -hmm. and long sideburns that he's had for 50 years. He's 77 <laughs> today as I talk to you. And he's never, you know, when 90210 came out, my dad was just on trend. It was like Jason Priestley, Luke Perry, and my dad had long sideburns. It was it was really funny, but he just never got rid of the long sideburns for, for 50 years. So I grew up in the deep south in America, um, in the U.S. Obviously, the racism and all that was a big conversation. Um, what was that conversation like in your house growing up, being brown in a community of 12 different kinds of white people? <laughs> yeah. Was that something that you got teased about or not really? Or how, how did that all play out? You know, today I would look back at it and I would say it was the kind of racism that uh, was invisible to me at the time. I think it did, mm -hmm. definitely existed. I, but I grew up for the most part through elementary and high school telling people that I, ex I experienced no racism because there was nothing overt. There was no name calling. I wasn't made to sit at the back of any bus. Uh, certainly the people I grew up with were very warm and kind and friendly. And there was a spirit of multiculturalism that did exist because in Canada, most people, it was some huge percentage, were one generation away from living in another country. Okay, <laughs> it wasn't, it didn't have the same longevity. So I experienced, you know, well, I, I didn't experience much racism. Having said that today, when I look back, and I'm like, hmm, you know, I never got a date to any dance ever. You know, there's a number of things where you look back and you're like, there probably mm. was some subtle and subconscious stuff happening that I just was not, not perceptive enough to notice as it, as it was happening. With the more informed conversation we're having today, I've actually been learning a lot 
about my own experience, to be honest with you, over the last couple of years, almost feeling ashamed that I'm like, wow, I was just perhaps my extremely low self-confidence. I mean, extremely, like in the gutter, I had extremely low self-confidence all the way up to my 30s. Perhaps some of that was a function of never, ever feeling like I was ever in any kind of room where I could see anyone that looked like me, you know? Right. I was always smaller. I was always the, the at any school photo, I was always the tiniest kid in the corner of the front row. I had thick glasses when before any other kids had glasses. I never made any sports teams. Yeah, maybe I'm just a loser. <laughs> maybe, maybe something was going on. Personal journeys continuing today, but I, I never experienced any as it was happening. Looking back, it's partly probably what's created some of the internal fight and struggle I still have inside myself. Mm. What was your idea of, or I'll say it like this, what was your family's idea of success when you were coming up, when you were in your developmental years? Yeah, so East Indian immigrant parents, success was defined with one word, my friend, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all paths lead to med school. Mm -hmm. And when my parents would get together with other family members, the conversation was, what's the marks? What's the marks in math? What's the marks in chemistry? What's, so which med school is he going to apply to? What kind of specialty will he do? I mean, this is when I was like 10 years old, 15 years old, you know? Oh, so-and-so is becoming a cardiologist. Oh, so-and-so is becoming a, you know, a, a gastrointestinologist or whatever. So it was, it was doctor. And the reason it was doctor is because in the culture I grew up in, that was considered the most fail-safe, conservative way to make a lot of money and therefore give you the big house, the ideally two kids, a boy and a girl. I mean, it was just in the water. And so even for me, look, today, I'm pretty far removed from being a doctor, but it was really hard for me, even in my last years of high school, to start to like drop biology class in favor of taking like writing, you know, like that was a hard sell <laughs> to my mm -hmm. parents at the time and um you know uh they were very open-minded and i i i was pretty independent and i went to business school i still went to like a top tier business school but that was a pretty big swerve away from the model of success which was definitely med school and get a big house and make a lot of money was there a lot of pushback from your parents when you chose to not take that path and go to business school instead like, yeah, was there drama I, or is it just like, oh, we're a little disappointed, but we're going to, you know, you know best? Well, there was a lot of stuff happening and this is good to talk about. I haven't talked about this much, but, um, you know, I remember reading the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad mm -hmm. in my senior year of high school by Robert Kiyosaki. And then sitting down with my parents and saying, I'm not going to university. I've decided to invest in commercial real estate. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it was like a absolute, it was an absolute, absolutely no. It was a hard, <laughs> hard no. <laughs> it was a, it was a hard no. And also just, just to, just to ladle in here, you know, in the culture I grew up in, you also listen to your parents. Like when they said hard no, I had no possible freedom to decide anything. And today I will, add, I get questions like this all the time. My parents won't let me do this. My parents won't let me do that. My parents won't let me and my boyfriend live together. I get questions like this all the time. And I can relate to these questions because I very much grew up in a similar philosophy. But what I say to people today is you got to figure out ways to A, test everything first. You can't live with your boyfriend, go on a vacation, <laughs> you know, and let's remember that our parents are alive for about half our lives. Okay. You, you got one life to live and it's yours. So we'll work within the cultures that we're brought up with. But, you know, I do advocate a spirit of trying to carve your own path. Now, uh, the idea of not going to university or college was simply not on the table. Um, and so I did, I did, I did go. And then coming out of Queens University, which is a school in Kingston, Ontario, Canada, that had a business school, um, I got the safe job. It was happened to be a marketing job at Procter and Gamble selling CoverGirl and Max Factor makeup. If you ever want to know about the lengthening, separating, and volumizing properties of mascara, I could tell you. Um, 
but you were a model. Is that in Cincinnati probably, or is that, you was that in Canada? probably already know all that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, uh, I worked for Procter & Gamble Canada. So it was based okay. in Toronto and then we'd have to go down to Cincinnati for a brand manager 101 and that type of training and stuff. But, but uh, no, and it just so happened that the company that I worked for, the brand I worked for, which was CoverGirl, was an acquisition. They bought a company that was based in Hunt Valley, Maryland, that owned uh, CoverGirl and um, uh, Nivea. Was it Nivea or Olay? Face cream. So I went, I actually traveled to Maryland a lot more than I traveled to Cincinnati. And did they pay for your MBA? My, my parents? No, no, no. Procter & Gamble. No, uh, it was interesting. On, I'm happy to talk about this. I haven't talked about it before. Baked into the spirit of the East Indian culture saying, thou shalt go to university was also, in my case, and we will pay for it. We want you to go so badly that we will pay for it, which is very, very, very fortuitous and very lucky. Because when you go to undergrad in Canada, I think maybe this is most schools, they ask you for um, your parents' past three years of income tax returns in order to assess you for financial need. But what I learned, and this is a very obvious piece of insight now, but I didn't realize it at the time, is when you go to do your master's, they ask you for your last three years of financial <laughs> statements, not your parents. Now you're a master's. So why is that important? Well, because um, I, had no, I had made no money. I had a year of undergrad at Queen's plus a year of Procter & Gamble, which by the way, didn't go well. I quit just before I was fired there and we could talk about that if you want. <laughs> and, and then I ran a restaurant that also made no money. So I had like a zero, 50 grand, zero kind of past three years. So because I was applying to Harvard and they're sitting on a huge golden nest egg, they're like, congratulations, you're so poor. We're gonna, get, we're gonna cover your tuition. And so I actually went on like a financial need package, uh, a scholarship called the John H. MacArthur Fellowship, which was created um, for Canadians below a certain income threshold to go to Harvard. And when I went there, there was 40 Canadians in my class of 900. I went to Harvard Business School from 2005 to 2007. And I found out that the majority of them received the same bursary because... I don't think it's this overt, but Harvard's philosophy is we really want to be in your will. We really, we, the, 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 the reason there's such largesse in their endowments is because at a very, they're playing a really long end game, which is at the very, very end of your life. We're just hoping to just remember your old pals at Harvard for one or 2% of your estate, you know? And so it's, it's, uh, they treat you very kindly. When you get a, when you get the welcome package from the Canadian school, congratulations, you got into the University of Toronto. It's like a letter, man. When you get the package from Harvard, it's like a box. There's a scarf in there. There's a mug. There's a, <laughs> they're selling it to you from the beginning. And you go down there to check it out. And you're like, oh my God, it's pastoral fields and 30 foot tall, like carved wooden doors. And the professors are dynamic and they're engaging. And it's like, oh my God, I was wooed. And I went there. And so from my age 25 to age 27, I pursued a second business degree, which by the way, I did because I didn't know what I was doing. I had failed at the office job at Procter & Gamble. I thought it was going to be a PowerPoint job, man. It was an Excel job. Okay. It was, I picked the wrong Microsoft <laughs> office suite package and <laughs> it didn't work. Uh, I was crunching the so spreadsheets till 10 o'clock at night. I was failing every which way on that job. You mentioned you had low self-esteem, right? Very and, much. And, and you almost got fired at Procter & Gamble. You had this failed restaurant. What made you think you could go to Harvard? What made you think Harvard was going to accept you in their MBA okay. program? Okay, I, 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 I absolutely did not think I was going to get accepted. I honestly <laughs> applied kind of on a dare, to be honest with you. I was like, okay. I, I applied to just a couple local schools, you know, and then I threw a dart at, at Harvard. And you know why I got accepted? Technically, nobody knows because the admissions process is a black box. They don't actually tell you how they decide. But I believe it's because my background was so unusual. 
it was just a bunch of hopscotch boxes, right? Like, what the hell is this guy doing? He he ran a restaurant this year, and then he did this weird marketing job, and he's from a different cultural background, and I didn't even tell you, but my big thing at, at campus, at undergrad, was I was the editor of the campus comedy newspaper, so I did, like, comedy writing internships in New York in between, so I got that thing on the resume. I think I got in because... Man, they're just looking for some people that aren't consultants. You know what I mean? I think they're looking to mix it up a bit there. They don't want everybody to be from private equity. So what was your archetype in that circle, in your class at Harvard? Were you the cl class clown? Were you the quirky guy the yeah. one who always noticed weird things? <laughs> yeah, and I'm still in a 14-person fantasy football league, and that's still my role. I mean, that's still the, I still write like a weekly funny write up every week in that, in that league that, you know, get everyone laughing. I thought I was going to get kicked out of that school the whole time. I was stressed. I was nervous. I was staying up till midnight reading cases to prepare. I was writing down because the way it works at HBS or Harvard Business School is every class is taught in a semicircle. Uh, with every seat being able to sort of see and face each other in something called the case method, uh, taught typically in the Socratic format. So the professor comes in, and if it's a finance class light, they might say, let's just say we're doing a finance case on, um, you know, a, a lumber company, uh, say. And, and my professor in finance is an incredibly wise uh, man named Andre Parole, who I deeply love. And I love the experience, I will say, on top of the stress. And it, he would say, like, you know, what is lumber? And you just, like, look around, like, you know, and people would start to, like, you know, he might like, kick on you to answer. And he'd be like, why? Why are we making? Why do people make that? You know? And, and you'd be like, okay, you try to answer this. And he's like, what is what does the business look like? You know, he, he just asked these, like, tiny little questions. And that's. He might ask 10 questions over 90 minutes. And then you get from there to like doing a discounted cash flow on whether this company should expand to it. It's really a profound method of teaching that takes incredible work and discipline and thought to figure out how to like orient a room where some people are coming. You know, Andre would say some of them are bankers and some of them are poets. You know, you've got a room in the class where people are coming from wholly different backgrounds and they're expected to learn together, and they do. It's pretty magical. And so my role- but At the class, end, you can like walk into a Starbucks and you can look around and see, oh, that's lumber, that's cardboard, that's a commodity, this is this, this is that, that's how much this labor costs, blah, 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 and kind of put it all together in your head. Is that the idea behind business school? It absolutely is. And I, I, I think you cannot, I got out of a four-year undergrad business degree at Queens. I will say, looking back, I knew how to do accounting, I knew how, you know, I knew, I knew, I knew the four P's of marketing, but I don't think I knew business, but I got out of that Harvard business school experience. And I, I felt like I really understood business and it's not, you know, unrelated to get into that program. They are looking for life and work experiences too, right? So you're not coming from high school. People are coming from, you know, uh, I worked at an oil and gas company in Nigeria. I was, you know, I, I was part of a publishing conglomerate in the Philippines. Like people have these experiences that you're constantly learning from in the room. And obviously the thing you take away more than anything else, like anywhere is the relationships. You keep connected, if you're lucky, with these people that then springboard out back around the globe. And to this day, some of my most valued friendships and most valuable connections are, you know, people that are just living in completely different worlds than, than mine. And that's what makes it, you know, special. Speaking of which, how did you meet Chris? I met him at Harvard Business School. I met him in, so we, I said there was 900 people coming in the class, right? They break you up into 10 sections of 90 people each. You spend the entire first year. I'm talking an entire year, my friend, with the same 90 people. You're in, you're with them in the morning. You're with them uh, at lunch. You're with them in the afternoon. You're with them and studying. You're with them on the Friday night social. You go to the dance with them. The 90 people that first year are tethered together in a way that I'd never experienced before. So Chris, Kim, and I were two of the 90 people. We connected for a few reasons. One was that 
he also felt a little bit out of place there. He was coming from, he did a Harvard undergrad, but he also was a Newton, Massachusetts high school teacher. Okay. He was coming from a, the poet side of the background, you know? Um, and we also both live pretty far off campus. So, you know, the majority of people live on campus. I, I was living with an old friend uh, from Toronto who was off campus, who was not going to Harvard Business School. He was uh, a campus, um, what are they called? Like in Canada, we call them dons, but they might call it residence advisor. He was like working at, a, at an undergrad residence, you know, holding heads above toilets, editing resumes, that whole thing. And so he would drive to school past where I lived. And so we had a commute together every day to and from campus. Um, so yeah, he's a, he's a really, really, really special person in my life. Was he in your wedding? Chris? You no, know, uh, be, uh, it's it's funny because I've had a few weddings. <laughs> the first one, the 2006 wedding. <laughs> yeah, so I got married in the summer after my first year. And at that point, nobody from Harvard had, had come because we were getting married back in Canada. Looking back, I wish I wish my friends from, from there were at that wedding, especially Chris. But, um, you know, it was it was its own thing. And I'm the reason listeners can hear me stumbling at this point in the conversation is because <laughs> everything we're talking about exited my life, you know. So do you want me to get into this? Yeah, let's get into it. OK, so. I, I, I was dating a woman. The first person who liked me back. <laughs> In my, in my life before I went down to Harvard and after a few months of being together a few months like I got down on one knee and I proposed she said yes and then I was whisked off to Boston and our engagement was spent from a distance planning the wedding that we were going to have the next summer okay I then became good great great friends with Chris um and what happened after Harvard was a couple things so I moved back to Toronto and Canada uh, after a 10,000 mile road trip with Chris around the whole state, whole US. It was wonderful. One of my fondest memories. And I settled back into my marriage, into my life there. Um, unfortunately, although my wife and I had now been together a couple of years, it turns out we were just getting to know each other then. And it turns out that it wasn't going great. And I was all in. I was of the East Indian mentality. There's no such thing as divorce in the culture that I grew up in. You just never hear that word. No one gets divorced. It's a black mark. It's not the sign of an enlightened culture as sort of, uh, you know, the rogue economist and books like that would argue today that it's the sign of actually healthy, the healthy culture that people feel free to not be, you know, uh, entombed into relationships that may be riddled with abuse or financial dependency, et cetera, et cetera. No, it was, it was, not something you did. And I drove home from work one night and I was back in Toronto now working at Walmart. I got my office job. I'm working in human resources. I'm a leadership development manager. I drove home from work. We just bought the house. And she says to me, I'm out. This isn't working. I don't love you. And I've met someone else. <clears throat> And that was a huge psychological uh, trap for me because I was in shock. But also I told you, I grew up with such low, it was like, and now I'm a failure. And now I'm a failure at this. And now I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not attractive. I'm not deserving of love. I'm not, you know, the confidence and all these traumas were just really kind of inside of me, kind of bubbling to the surface. And at the same time, over this kind of tumultuous path post-Harvard, Chris attempted suicide once, and it was a terrible experience. He, I just visited him. He had called. I, we were talking on the phone three, four times a week. He called me up from the hospital and said, "I'm in recovery. I, I have attempted suicide. I, I'd love you to come visit me, and I need you to help me because I need to get on the right medications. I need to see the right psychiatrist, and I need you to get more. Can, can you get a bit more involved in my health?" And I did. But then as I was going through this process of the divorce and the selling my house, he then took his life, attempted to take his life a second time, and this time was successful. And so I lost- You talked to him the night before. Yeah. Well, I talked to him the night before that he left. He left on, he left basically driving down the road trip path that we had come on. 
the other way. We drove from West Coast to East Coast on the return trip. He drove from East Coast to West Coast. We caught up to him. Uh, yeah, I haven't talked about this before. We caught up to him at a hotel room. We were we were trying to use the police to track his credit card payment so that we could find him because we thought it was a pretty scary situation. And we caught up to him at a hotel room in Colorado and his sister was able to get him on the phone and in that particular state, even with police and psychologists present, you cannot enter someone's hotel room. And um, she was able to talk to him on the phone at the hotel. And then he shot himself overnight in the hotel. And so, um, but I talked to him the day before he left. And I, and I talked to Rena, his sister. I said, I think I was the last person to talk to him. She's like, Actually, I just talked to him last night, you know? And so um, I was just in a complete disaster. I, I had, I'm trying to sell a house, <laughs> which is a, its own mess. I'm trying to process my divorce paperwork. I'm trying to come to terms with the fact that my wife was interested in another guy. And my best friend is, is gone. You know, he's, he's just disappears. It's just the person I would probably be most talking to about the whole divorce at the same time. And the person I'd be talking to most about losing my friend is my wife. And that was also gone. And so I felt completely untethered. I felt completely um, uh, searching. Uh, There's a lot of tears. I was, I was, there was a lot of stress. I lost a lot of weight. And in the midst of this zone, that's really, it's a, it's a, it's a period of, that stretches out over a few months. Um, that's when, to try to cheer myself up, I start a website. I start a website. I, what else am I got? There's news is negative. The, the, everything online is negative. I got no one to talk to. I'm home by myself. I go to Google. I type in how to start a blog. I press on feeling lucky. Light at the time, you, 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 you remember this. But blogs were what everyone was doing. 50,000 blogs were started a day. It was kind of pre, you know, Instagram and Twitter and stuff getting real popular. And so I started a website called 1000awesomethings.com as a way to try to cheer myself up. It was like the way you would sort of reach for something and not know if it was going to work. But I was like, I just want to force myself to write something positive before I go to bed because I can't sleep because I got all the stress in my stomach. And so it sucked. My website sucked. It was the <laughs> it was the number 1,000 post on my blog was called Brocco Flower, the strange mutant hybrid child of nature's ugliest vegetables. I mean, <laughs> this uh, my website sucked, but it was me trying to reach for a, you know, a, a vine out of the quicksand. You were seeing a therapist twice a week. Was that an idea that she she said, hey, Neil, you got to start journaling. You got to start expressing. Was that is that where that idea came from? Or what, what preceded you getting online and starting up that website? Um, I had written for a comedy newspaper in college. I remembered the deep joy that I had as a child writing and reading, especially comedy. And that love I had, that early love of writing comedy and trying to write comedy. So it was a safe place for me. Um, and I, the therapist actually came from my mom, you know, you know, I felt like a real loser at the time for my mom suggesting I go to therapy. Like I, I, I equated therapy. It wasn't in the, A, I wasn't where I am now, but B, I don't think therapy was where it is now. It was equated with you got problems, you know, you're crazy, you got, you're crazy, you got total problems. And so I went to the therapist and you're supposed to, it was, it was my mom's therapist. So even worse, even more embarrassing <laughs> for me. She's like, you need to see a therapist now. And I'm going to, you should go to the one I got, just really? go now. Just, you know, like I'll give you my appointment kind of thing. And so I go to see the guy and, I, and, and he's like, can you come back tomorrow? <laughs> you know, it was like, cause I, I, I couldn't, I, I had, I had a lot of stuff to process a lot. I was trying to process massive amounts of emotional stuff all at once. And I didn't know, I didn't have the tools to be able to do that. So the blog was one tool. The therapy was one tool. 
yeah, looking back, I know that focusing on gratitude is scientifically proven and we can talk about that. I know that journaling is scientifically proven and we can talk about that, but I was just grasping at stuff. I was just grasping at stuff, you know. My parents were also like, you know, trying to load up my freezer with like healthy homemade food. Uh, I was, I was, I was, I wrote about Chris on my blog. I wrote a big essay about my relationship with him and it turned my little tiny comedic blog about broccoli flower into something that I, I posted it. I called it smiling and thinking about good friends who are gone. And I wrote a big essay about him. So I was trying my best with the limited tools I have to process things however I could. And I will, it's pretty obvious looking at it now. I didn't have, I didn't have much I didn't have that much perceived challenge in my life until that point. So when I hit these two huge things at once, I didn't have the equipment. I didn't have the skills. I didn't have the resilience to deal with it. So you've mentioned in a previous interview, I heard you said, you know, when you were younger, you would quit things a lot. Yeah. And your mom <laughs> would be cool with you quitting things a lot. Talk about your sort of mental process in, in locking into a thousand things and the schedule every day like yeah. where did that come from did you inherit that in in business school or you know working in leadership development at well, walmart or? well so first of all writing i started the blog i'm not kidding in 10 in 10 minutes like you you go mm -hmm. you type in how to start a blog you press i'm feeling lucky the first hit that comes up like is a site i had never heard of at the time called wordpress i clicked that button <laughs> and it said right there on the button click here to start a blog in 10 minutes. So I click there. It says, come up with a name. Well, my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law, you know, in the relationship that I was in that was ending, she always said everything was awesome. She said, mm. well, that's awesome. That's awesome. I had this word ringing in my head. I was like, okay, I never used it myself. I was like, okay, awesome. And uh, I don't know, a hundred felt small and a million felt big. So I just wrote a thousand. I actually did not do the math to realize that that actually would take four straight years of writing one every day, right? I didn't, I was like a thousand doesn't sound that big, does it? You know, everyone's talking millions, billions, thousands sound small. Why do I mention that? Because it wasn't like a thing that I made a commitment to doing for four years, but what it's still the hardest project I've ever undertaken. I will say creatively in my life. And many times over those four years, I wanted to quit. I wanted to stop. There was many days I'm like, well, that's the end of that. I got 12 ideas. Like we're done, you know? But what happened was when you start to, when you put a, a little flag above yourself in the world, you know, that old Ralph Waldo Emerson quote, isn't that far off. When you decide what you want to do, the universe conspires to make it happen. And when I started writing about awesome things, I eventually sent an email after five or 10 posts to people. My mom sent it to my dad. My traffic doubled. I started getting 10 hits. Guess what? When anyone in my life started thinking of something good that happened to them, they sent it to me. And the little blog, which had one comment, started to get three comments. And people posted one. So like, oh, how about the cold side of the pillow? Or have you written about getting called up to the dinner buffet at a wedding? So I was just taking other people's idea and trying to write them out. And when you do that more, the comments get big. I remember the first day I got like 20 comments on a post. And then one day I got 100. And then I wrote this post called Old Dangerous Playground Equipment. I got 500 comments, right? And it made the front page of this website at the time, which is really big, called Fark.com. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah. Fark.com, right? And it was like Dig.com, right? Like those are the websites that kind of start the blog started getting okay, 5,000 hits a day, 10,000 say 50,000 hits a day. Like it started getting bigger and bigger, a million blog hits on the side, then 5 million and 10 million. And I didn't think of it like a project I was necessarily going to commit to for a thousand days, but I'm saying that second law, of, yeah, that second law of physics an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by equal or greater force. It's true. And so the hardest part often is to start these things. And sometimes when they start the momentum and the motivation and the capability that you think in your own head, that comes after, right? So it accelerated as a practice and it became 
easier as I was doing it. Not always easy and often not, but it became easier than those first clunky attempts on the first day and the second day and the third day. Mm. And if you ask me, where did I get into like a publishing rhythm? Yeah, I mean, I guess at Queens University, when I was editor of that campus comedy newspaper, we put out a paper every single week. So I was familiar with the process of getting together on Sunday with a group of people having literally nothing written and not going home till 4 a.m. on Monday morning when the thing was done. And it would come out every day on Wednesday. And it was a comedy mm -hmm. newspaper. We weren't reporting on things. We made it all up. And it was like a 40-page newspaper. So we wrote an entire newspaper. It was the number one campus newspaper across the country in terms of ad sales and ad revenue because it was very, very well read. And we put the whole thing together every Sunday. And I just knew that mental philosophy of starting with nothing and then publishing before you go home. So I had that baked in me, I think, from four years at Queens. Your most recent book that's about to come out in December 2022, Our Book of Awesome, in the yeah. introduction to that book, yeah. you admit that you needed this. You needed this, this other this exercise. So now going back to the original one, yeah. I know for myself, you know, I've been writing this daily dose of inspiration for over six years now. So I I literally see the world in frames of inspirational experiences was that happening to you were you like going out of your house now living your same life but now all you're kind of noticing are awesome things to write about especially when you're getting those 20 30 40 50 comments on your posts a hundred percent i was keeping notes in my pocket i was being it was easier to add to them and you know what it's it was years later that I first heard of this thing in your brain called your visual cortex. And it was years later that I heard that there's an area in your brain called Area 17. And it was years later that I heard that there's these famous researchers down at the University of Texas called Slatcher and Pennebaker who did all this foundational work on journaling. And they showed that when you journal about a positive experience that happens in your daylight, and you know this because you see the world this way through your inspiration, inspiration emails, guess what? It lights up area 17 in your visual cortex as if you're doing it again. And your brain does not know the difference between what's happening right in front of your eyes and what's happening in your mind. Meaning that if you write about the cold side of the pillow, it feels to your mind like you are flipping to the cold side of the pillow. And if you read your own journal, if you read your own email, which you do before you send it, and I did before I post it, and I did after, you know, then guess what? You get a doubling, a tripling, a quadrupling effect. And... On top of all that, you are actually carving out the neural pathways in your brain responsible for positive thinking. And this activity and this behavior is so fundamentally important to all of us because our brains naturally go the opposite way. 300,000 years of Homo sapiens evolution on top of 3 million years with the same brains? We're good at looking for problems, man. Our brains are good at looking for problems. That's what they are designed to do. You look for a problem, you find problem, you solve problem. And that is still the orientation of our entire society today. When you get the math test back, you look for the one question you got wrong. When you get the blood test back, you look for the high cholesterol. When you look at the rank, when you look at the reviews in your podcast, I guarantee your brain looks for the one that's one star first. When you go on Amazon, you look for the one-star review first. Our brains are designed to look for problems. However, we happen to live in the most abundant society ever in human history. I'm not saying that stuff happening in the news isn't real. I'm not saying that. But I am saying we do live in the most abundant time ever in human mm -hmm. civilization. You can press a button, uh, have food on your porch in 20 minutes. You know, you could you could go anywhere in the world, like feasibly. You could see things. We live like kings lived 100 years ago, but we don't feel that way because our brains are still the same brains. And so this exercise and this practice that you have with your six-year-long daily email, and I had for the four years I did the blog, and the 11 years I've done since, still writing them down, that's the basis of our Book of Awesome. It's another 500 of them, okay, is a vital practice to cultivating a positive mindset. And if you could cultivate the positive mindset, man, everything else opens up. And we could talk about the research on that. But it is the lead domino to productivity, to creativity, to social connection, to almost 
anything you can measure. This comes from Sonia Libomirsky over at Stanford, then the University of California from her wonderful book, The How of Happiness. Happy, a cultivating a positive mindset is the lead domino to almost everything. So you don't necessarily need to listen to this and say, oh, I got to write a daily email like Light, or I got to write a daily awesome thing like Neil. But there's got to be something. There's got to be something that you do where you look for positive things every day. You can put it on a pen, on a pen and paper. You could do a two-minute morning journaling practice, which we can talk about. That's another thing I'm a big advocate for. You could write it on your phone when no one sees. But if you do that practice, you're cultivating the mindset that will lead to massive benefits for you. Beautiful, man. Last question for you. How are you defining success for yourself? today like what is what does success look like for neil in 2022 success for neil in 2022 is being able to eat lunch with my wife during the week mm. now that, because i travel sometimes to give his speeches it's not always possible but when i have lunch with my wife at lunch during the week right which i did today i think to myself this is it this is it. This is what I was playing for the whole time. Beautiful, man. Brother, I want to acknowledge you for, uh, for being so transparent and for getting into all of those details that uh, maybe you don't talk about a whole lot on these kinds of platforms. And, um, and just for all the things you've done and shared with the world, I mean, it's, it's, it's literally and ironically awesome <laughs> just to witness that, to, to, to have a a um, archive of all of these little things for yourself, for your kids, for generations that haven't even been born yet. And then I get to actually talk to you and ask you questions. You and I met was 2017 or something like that. Yeah. In, New York. yeah. Well, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn at the shy movement. Yeah. So it's been, it's been a, I don't see you enough. I think that's the only time I've ever seen you in person and we need to fix that some way, somehow. So I know you're always inviting me to come to Canada, but hopefully we'll be able to connect at some point sooner rather than later and spend some real quality time together. So I just want to thank you so much for, for coming on and, and agreeing to be my guest on my little podcast here. You beam, exude positive vibes. You are a joy to be around. You fill me up when I hang out with you and I talk to you. <laughs> thank you for the gift of this conversation and thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. If you like that video, you're going to love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.